Uh, welcome, everybody, uh, on a Monday afternoon. Um, I want to thank you. I'm Susan Glasser, and I'm the editor of Foreign Policy Magazine. And I want to welcome you here to the New America Foundation, uh, our good friends and partners. Uh, and uh, you know, I figured we'd get a fairly full room uh, to have a conversation about foreign policy's first ever sex issue. Uh, I want to remind everybody before we jump right into it, we are being live streamed uh, on New America's website, and we are definitely going to get to your questions uh, and answers in the session when we do. I hope that you'll uh, be able to give us your, your name and a little bit of sense of where you're coming from. And uh, in the meantime, I know that the time is going to go pretty quickly because we have uh, two extraordinary uh, contributors and, and authors here with us today, uh, Mona Altahawe and Kareem Sajapur. And uh, in many ways, their uh, articles speak for themselves. Um, but I will let you be the judge of that. And I know you all have copies of the magazine, too. I just wanted to say a couple words, both of welcome uh, and explanation First, uh, to everybody, before we jump right into our conversation, uh, as, I, as I wrote in the editor's note uh, to this issue of that magazine, this is something very different for Foreign Policy Magazine. Uh, we're 40 years old. Actually, this is our 41st year this year. And I think it's safe to say that in all those 41 years, uh, there never was an issue of this magazine devoted uh, to the subject either of women or, as we framed it more broadly, of, of sex uh, in the history of the magazine. Uh, you know, this is. Uh, uh, a realm of journalism and of uh, scholarly journals in which uh, such matters really didn't figure uh, in, until recently. To the extent they did, it was really as a sort of marginal aside uh, to the kind of waiting conversations that we were supposed to have about uh, important geopolitical issues. Uh, and uh, so, you know, we were pretty aware that this was this was a departure, and I hope uh, a good one, and certainly an important one for us as a magazine. Uh, and uh, one thing I would say to you is that we were very determined from the beginning of launching into this issue of the magazine uh, to make sure that uh, it wasn't just uh, another sort of marginalized conversation about gender or about women. And so while there are a number of articles in this issue that do touch on uh, subjects of women's political empowerment, for example, we have a unique survey of women political leaders, uh, that we were determined that the sex issue of foreign policy also should really go ahead and look at the third rail uh, of this conversation, which is sex itself. And if you look at uh, Mona's cover story, if you look at Kareem's very powerful piece about Iran, you will see uh, that these are real discussions about the role that sex plays in shaping uh, politics, both inside countries and regions and in how we look and think about them. Uh, and I think that was something that's important and that certainly has, has stirred up a real conversation. Uh, and so what I thought we'd do today, and certainly I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing your, your questions and thoughts uh, about that in a broad sense, uh, as well as the two articles that I'm hoping we can discuss in more detail. Uh, Mona's cover story, I should tell you, Why Do They Hate Us? The War on Women in the Middle East uh, is by far and away the most commented upon, discussed, viewed, liked, tweeted, blogged about, I suppose disliked, uh, article we've ever published, uh, I think, uh, in foreign policy, certainly during my tenure. Right now, I, I printed out the statistics before I came down here today. Right now, uh, at the most recent reckoning, 54,468 people have liked this article on Facebook. Uh, it has approximately 1,700 comments on the site. It has innumerable uh, tweets, uh, blog posts, responses, counter responses, responses to the responses. Uh, so, you know, in many ways, I would say that that it is in some measure achieved exactly what we hoped for it when we first talked about it, which was that it would convene a conversation that I think I don't believe or, or you know, that, that Mona believes was really being had in a sufficient way. So in that sense, uh, we couldn't be more gratified uh, that we've used the convening power of foreign policy to convene a conversation about what is happening to women in the Middle East, especially in the context of this post-Arab Spring moment that we're living in? Uh, and so we're going we're gonna to turn to Mona about that. Kareem, I have to say, is here not only because he has contributed really a, a must-read piece about uh, the sexual obsessions of Iran's Ayatollahs, but also because he is, in many ways, sort of the, the intellectual author, or at least partner in crime, of, the, of this entire issue, which was born in a conversation that, that he and I 
first had, I, I believe it was three years ago, more, more or less exactly this spring, in which we talked about uh, the extent to which sex really is, is the elephant in the room. It is the thing that journalists, that policymakers at a very senior level, uh, at people who spend time on the ground thinking, at scholars, uh, it's the thing that they talk about amongst themselves and frankly don't share that conversation with you when it comes to their analysis about the region. And uh, for a variety of complicated reasons, uh, uh, it leads to a certain kind of dishonesty, it seems to me, in what you know the sort of expert class has been willing to make transparent and public about their own debates about what's happening uh, in Iran and in, in the broader region. And so uh, the article that he produced, uh, which is filled with really extraordinary detail, uh, that I gave me a new way of thinking about the politics of the Islamic Republic, uh, e is a three-year-old answer to, to that conversation. Uh, and I'm going to sort of leave the weighty preamble uh, at that. There have been, as I said, an enormous number of critical responses, uh, uh, both for uh, and against, if you could be that sort of zero sum about it, uh, that both of these pieces have stirred up. And then there's a whole lot more nuanced you know, reaction that falls just in every circle in between. One thing I, I want to start us off with in talking with Mona is, uh, and perhaps this is not surprising, uh, an enormous amount of conversation here in the United States about, well, you know, how does the United States figure in this? You know, they, it seems to me, Mona, that they read your very carefully worded uh, preamble in the piece where you tried to sort of say, like, okay, this is a piece about women in the Middle East. We understand, yes, the United States has problems. Yes, there's not a woman president. Yes, there's issues here. But this one piece is not going to be about that. That didn't seem to be sufficient for, for certain corners uh, of the blogosphere universe. And I, I do find that striking, that we here in the United States always seem to want to turn the conversation into one about us. Uh, but let me start out by kicking right back to you. Tell me a little bit about what this experience of the last week has been like right. for you in publishing this piece. Right. Well, good afternoon, every good afternoon, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. And I've got to say that I've achieved one of my major ambitions this week, and that is to get more comments than Maureen Dowd does. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm very happy. Um, the, the reaction to this piece has been phenomenal. I mean, uh, when it first was posted on you know, Sunday midnight last week, and the reaction began to pick up. And at first, I was joking that I'd set Twitter and Facebook on fire. But it's got to the stage where I go to birthday parties and people say things like, oh, my dad sent me this piece, and my cousin sent me this piece, and you know, my, my grocery store owner sent me this piece. So it's like I've set the entire world on fire. And I'm very glad, because it is a long, long overdue conversation. And it's funny that you should mention that the people in the US seem to always want the conversation to be about them, because people in the Middle East also want to be the conversation to be about the US. <laughs> because some of the reaction that I've got has been, well, it's not so great for women in the US either. And you know, I'm not an idiot. I know this. <laughs> I've lived in, in this country for 12 years. And you have to, you, you'd have to be a real moron to think that women have figured everything out and that women have have, have overcome patriarchy and misogyny everywhere across the world. I mean, this is a given. I do not need to write an essay in foreign policy that says women have it hard everywhere. This is just, you know, everybody knows this. But what I wanted to do for a change was to focus on my community. And I think what the reaction speaks to is just how difficult it is to be a woman of color and to have to choose between all the identities you have. Mm -hmm. Because women are always asked to choose, well, no, women are always asked to pledge allegiance first to the community. And the community can be religion, it can be ethnic background, it can be a variety of things. And then when women ask that community to show some of that support back, they usually and invariably let down. And I've gotten to the stage in my life now where, you know, I've done all the essays. I've done so many essays and op-eds <laughs> about Islamophobia mm -hmm. and, um, not every Muslim man in America is horrible. And how my brother is a doctor who is a cardiologist who saves American lives every day. And not how you know, we're not responsible for 9-11. I've done all those essays. I've served my community beautifully. But when I turn around and tell my community, it is now time to focus on me 
and gender rights, my community goes nuts. Mm -hmm. And this is what has happened over the past week. Mm -hmm. So w with, with the revolutions, I mean, this is the most exciting time of my life. I've, I've been on doing the media rounds, saying this now for 14 months since Hosni Mubarak was forced to step down. This is the most exciting time of my life because I'm so glad to be alive for these revolutions. But I'll be damned if I'll watch these revolutions and not have my community pay back some of that support because women were out there on the front lines and women were out there fighting alongside men. And if at this time, this most exciting time of our lives, we're not talking about overthrowing the misogyny and the patriarchy that in turn oppresses women, Mubarak and the, and the dictators, as I keep saying, oppress all of society. I'm aware of this. It oppresses men, it oppresses children, it oppresses dogs, it oppresses horses. I know this. But in turn, that society, on another level now, because there's a hierarchy of, of misogyny and oppression, that hierarchy oppresses women. And this is what I want to talk about. And at that one point where I'm saying, let's focus on women, because if we miss this opportunity, we're going to miss a historic opportunity. I'm being told, no, let's talk about America. Well, I don't want to talk about America. <laughs> I want to talk about women, because this is the time to talk about them. In the 1950s, when my feminist heroes, and there are many throughout history, when my feminist heroes were fighting for women's rights in Egypt after what was then called the revolution, which was essentially a military coup, the standard or the bar that we were talking about was up here. Now in Egypt and many parts of the Middle East, it's down here. The fight is even harder. So I have to go for the jugular. I have to kick where it hurts. And I don't want to talk about America. I'm not asking America to invade. I'm asking the people in those countries themselves to be honest with ourselves, to be self-critical. And, and by not talking about America, I'm actually asking us to be empowered. Because when the conversation is always about America, we are second in the conversation. We make America much more powerful than we are. I don't care about America. What America says about me and my community is chatter. When you make that chatter the most important part of the conversation, then you have made, you have degraded yourself. And I think a lot of people miss this in the conversation. I want to make us the focus of our conversation, which is what these revolutions have been. They've been about us and Mubarak. And yes, we've turned around and said to America, five of your presidents have supported Mubarak, and we're not going to have that anymore. But let's take that conversation deeper and talk about what our culture what our society does to women. Because when we have that conversation, we'll realize how bad things are, and then we can start talking. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I think, Mona, you, you've hit on something I know we're going to keep talking about in the conversation. I, I want to bring Kareem into it. But I was struck by, by that very urgent tone of so much of the, the response. We ha where's the United States? Where's the United States? And then, actually, it's sort of internally contradictory, because the other major strand of questions or concerns for you as an author has been, what about the agency uh, of women in the Middle East? And which, of course, is exactly what you're talking about right now. And often the very same critic uh, both thinks that you haven't allowed women in the Middle East to be agents enough of your conversation. At the same time, they're demanding that it be more like the US. And this was a, from a, a major US blog uh, on a sort of feminist blog just today. What I felt was truly missing from El Tahawi's piece was any connection between what is happening in predominantly Muslim countries and what is happening against women in the United States. So this is you know very much, uh, I think, out there what, what Mona has flagged. Um, so I want to bring. Kareem into that, uh, and then we can talk about whether there is this kind of equivalence that, that some feminists in the US seem to be demanding mm -hmm. uh, of this conversation. What struck you both by the response uh, to your piece uh, and that of Mona, and perhaps there is an interesting equivalence, right? Because there's been some controversy about your piece, but at the same time, the kind of visceral, personal uh, critiques uh, have largely been absent, which is interesting in its own right, isn't yeah, it? Yeah. First, um, um, thank you, Susan, for inviting me. And, and I, I want to also salute Mona for an incredibly powerfully argued piece. Um, it's, if I had an agent, they'd probably have advised me against being on a panel entitled, uh, being the lone male on a panel entitled, <laughs> Why Do They Hate Me? <laughs> <laughs> But, um, um, We're giving Kareem an <laughs> ultimate pass here. We're, let's just stipulate that he is a lover. We love you, Kareem. Don't <laughs> yes. worry about it. <laughs> but um, I, what, what I thought was interesting about um, the remarkable reaction to Mona's piece and the much smaller reaction to my piece was the fact that um, um, I saw that among kind of the intellectual community and the um, Middle East studies community and uh, among a Arab women, 
uh, Mona's piece was perceived as quite controversial. There was a lot of people who liked it, a lot of people who argued against it. And when I embarked on my piece, and as Susan mentioned, this is a piece I'd been thinking about for a very long time. It's probably not wise to say I've been thinking about sex in Iran for a very long <laughs> time, but uh, the reality is that um, you know, it's an issue which I've, I've found in every aspect of Iranian politics. Um, and so when I reached out to a lot of different Iranians, males and females, about this issue of sex in Iran, not one person told me, you're actually really off. The mullahs really don't care that much about sex. Not one person uh, said that to me. On the contrary, everyone said, of course. They, you know, they, these, uh, they, they've long been obsessing about these issues of sexuality. And one of the things I wrote was that for most Iranians, um, the issue had become kind of um, so inherent to their daily interactions with Iranian officialdom that they actually tuned it out. They said, this is actually not really something that's newsworthy or noteworthy to write about um, the Iranian regime's obsession with sex. We all, we all know this. Um, so what I found interesting was that, in a way, it, the reactions to our pieces shows you where Iranian society is, perhaps vis-a-vis -vis Arab society. Um, that in, in, in Iran, um, I, I think that you know, there was, a, was a, an op-ed which Shirin Ebadi, the Iranian Nobel Peace Laureate, wrote in the Wall Street Journal uh, about six weeks ago, um, warning Arab women against the types of uh, kind of complacence and um, cultural relativism, relativism which Iranian women succumbed to um, three decades ago and warning them to be vigilant. And what I saw, and again, again my, my um, survey isn't scientific, but it was my interpretation that Mona's piece was the, the reaction among Iranians, especially Iranian women, was overwhelmingly positive. I don't know if you got that yeah, uh, I impression did. as well. I did, yeah. Um, so it kind of shows you um, where these two uh, societies are at. And it's not uh, being, I'm not trying to be um, uh, a Persian uh, cultural chauvinist. It's just by virtue of the fact that having lived under an Islamist uh, regime for, for three decades, which um, has made sex um, uh, an inherently uh, uh, political thing, uh, part and parcel of, of your daily life, uh, that I think people have, have reached the conclusion that um, you know, it's important to be um, intolerant towards intolerance, if, if, if that's a, a way of putting it. Yeah, you know, I think that's a really important point too, is that the politics really does shape the narrative about sex, which of course goes right back to why is it that we launched into this mm -hmm. exercise in the first place. And you know, I was gonna ask you, Mona, did you ever, think a year ago, you know, sort of the height of the, the revolution when there was, a, of course, a, a lot of optimism uh, about what a post-Mubarak Egypt might look like. Uh, it's really striking how quickly uh, it's turned in a very different direction. Uh, you've written a piece that my guess is you, you probably didn't expect to need to have written uh, a year ago at this time. Well, you know, I remain very optimistic about the Egyptian revolution. I remain optimistic about it because the fundamental change that it, it's brought about for Egyptian society, and you can say the same for Tunisia and all the other countries undergoing their own uprisings and revolutions, is that it's, it's put fully kind of square in front of everything, this idea of accountability, that, that the Egyptians who went out on the street and demanded that Hosni Mubarak step down have essentially sent out a message to anybody now who will be... Egypt's president or who will be Egypt's government, that we will hold you accountable, no matter who you are, that never again will we allow someone to rule us for 30 years without accountability. So this idea is the idea that, that keeps me optimistic about the Egyptian revolution. And that's exactly the idea that's at the heart of my piece. Now, my piece didn't just come about because foreign policy commissioned it and wrote to me and said, would you like to write about women's issues? It, it, I'm glad you wrote that email to me because it was a culmination of many pieces that I'd been writing for the past few months. Mm -hmm. Because over the past year, I'd written several pieces for The Guardian, the British newspaper, The Guardian, which began with those awful so-called virginity tests that the, the Egyptian military junta imposed on female activists when they cleared Tahrir Square. They cleared Tahrir Square on March 9th, and very soon after, tortured most of the activists, male and female. But for the unmarried female activists that they, that they detained, they imposed a form of sexual assault that is known or otherwise called as virginity tests, 
When those virginity tests were exposed by a young Egyptian woman, I mean, and talk about agency, and I mentioned her in my essay, when a young Egyptian woman called Salwal Husseini, just a regular working class young Egyptian woman, said, I was one of the 17 young women sexually assaulted by the military. This is what happened to me. People just shut her down. They said, you're lying. You're trying to make our good, noble military look bad. This was at a time when Egyptians were still saying that the, the military and the people are one hand because they were so relieved that the military sided with the people against Mubarak, even though the military at the same time that it appeared to not be opening fire on people in the way that it did in Libya and Syria and other countries. The Egyptian military nonetheless was detaining people. Egyptian military police were torturing people. I've had my own experience with Egyptian military police when they detained me for six hours after my assault in uh, close to Tahrir last year. So this idea of you know, touching the, the, the noble military. Salwa Hussein basically, Salwa Husseini broke the silence and then and nothing happened. Nothing happened. People should have been outraged that female revolutionaries were sexually assaulted by the military, and nothing happened. And I wrote a, a piece for The Guardian saying, this should spark Egypt's second revolution, and nothing happened. And then a young Egyptian called Alia El Mahdi posed in the nude for her blog. Now, compare the two here. The military sexually assaults 17 female revolutionaries, nothing happens. A young Egyptian woman of 21 takes a picture of herself nude in her parents' living room, posts it on her blog, and all hell breaks loose. Because this woman chose to be naked on her own blog. You have to visit her blog to see her nudity. And all hell breaks loose. And she is accused of tainting the revolution. And I'm sitting there thinking, what is going on? What is happening in Egypt that this young woman is accused of tainting the revolution when the military junta is sexually assaulting female revolutionaries. We've got things upside down here. And then 70% of the Egyptian parliament is now controlled by Islamists. So, and I'm talking about the bar that in the 1950s was here. Now we're talking about Salafis who control 25% of the Egyptian parliament who believe that in order to run for parliament, a female candidate's face cannot be shown on posters, a flower in, her, in place of her face is shown. And we've got parliamentarians obsessed with internet porn and reducing the age at which girls can marry to 14. And I'm called the neo-orientalist native informant. And I have to sit there and think, what is happening to my beautiful Egyptian revolution? Because we have to be real here. What is going on? Is this about, we, we don't want to look bad? We don't want people to become Islamophobic? I'm very well aware of the ugly Islamophobia that exists around the world. I've lived in this country for 12 years. I'm very well aware of the ugly anti-Arab racism that exists. But I'm also painfully aware, because I've experienced it myself, when I was sexually assaulted and had my arms broken in Cairo, but through my own conversations and the statistics. This doesn't have to be personal. The statistics speak for themselves. Every single Arab country lies in the bottom 35 of the 135 of the Global Gender Index. This is not something I have made up. It's not a figment of my imagination. So we have to get to a stage where we have to ask ourselves, if these are revolutions about freedom and dignity, whose freedom and dignity are we talking about? You know, Mona, I think these are just incredibly powerful points that you're making. And I have to say that one thing that's been striking to me as someone who is from the outside, you know, sort of observing and moderating and, you know, in a way curating this debate as an American woman, I've been, you know, perhaps it was predictable you tried to head off this, this concern and this critique in your essay by saying, listen, this is going to be one essay that's not about the United States. And nonetheless, that hasn't stopped, uh, you know, this enormous outpouring of, but wait, what about us? What about us? I mean, I'm, I'm really quite embarrassed in many ways, I have to say, as, as someone who lives in the United States, who, who does, by the way, think of myself as a feminist. Uh, you know, I'm the, the editor of a magazine about world affairs. and. You know, the idea that we're so insecure here as, as women in the United States that we insist upon having a conversation about the war on us here, it's just not the same thing. I mean, you know, just last week, the Grand Mufti of Saudi Arabia uh, was, you know, very upset that uh, we were criticizing, uh, allowing young girls to get married at the age of 12. He actually said, well, 10 is really appropriate, I think. Uh, you know, and this was in the middle, again, of this, this, this sort of discussion and controversy over your article. Uh, when, when Blake, our colleague, the managing editor of FP, tweeted it, there was an entire blog response criticizing him uh, for tweeting this. And this was 
apparently denying us here in the United States the opportunity to have a debate about the war on women in the United States. You know, I'm sorry, and I'm sure that there are people in the audience who want to weigh in on this, and perhaps there are some who disagree with this, but you know what? Uh, there's been a lot of sexism I've experienced. I'm sure you have here in the United States experienced these things. This is just not the same thing, folks. <laughs> and it's, it's been quite interesting uh, and amazing to me to, to see this happen. I mean, we are not talking about a situation where we're going to legalize child rape at the age of 10. You know, we're not talking about a situation in the United States uh, where uh, it's legal to beat your wife as long as you do it with good intentions, as you point out in the piece. I mean, these are just not the same thing. These are basic what I would consider to be hu human rights issues that, that you're discussing in your piece when it comes to the status of women in, in the Middle East. But I, Kareem, I want to I wanna bring you here on this question of the revolution uh, and you know, sort of when politics becomes overriding in a society like Egypt or in one like Iran, uh, why women so quickly become targets. Uh, this is something that, that Secretary of State Hillary Clinton pointed out and uh, I think she was right to do so just a few weeks ago. She said, you know, there's an inevitable connection, in fact, between political upheaval uh, and men in societies who immediately respond to it by wanting to control women. You point out in your piece uh, that the critique of women and whether their hair should be shown in Iran, it's, it's the same language used uh, by the authorities to criticize the Green Movement protesters. The, the Iranian Supreme Leader Ali Khamenei was um, reacting to those who criticized Iran for the obli obligatory headscarf, the hijab. Um, and his, he framed his, his reaction in an interesting way. He said that um, we're not misogynist, we're actually misandrist. Misandrist means basically we, we, we don't like men. We, we can't, he didn't use that word, but basically that's how he, he framed it. He said it's not women who are the problem, men are the problem because men uh, can't control themselves, and if women go uh, unveiled, then the entire family unit will become unraveled, because men will just be like these ravenous dogs that will go after women, and uh, all society will, will fall apart. And um, interestingly, you know, when I first started writing the article, and I should acknowledge the editor, I think he's somewhere here, Ben, ben Parker, did a fabulous job, um, I, was, I was looking at the region more broadly, and I was reading a lot of the writings of uh, Sayyid Qutb, whom you all know is one of kind of the intellectual fathers of the Muslim Brotherhood, and that was a very similar argument to what Qutb was making, that basically that the family unit is integral to the health of society, um, and it must remain intact. And again, Khamenei was saying that if women unveil, then it will, it will cause a revolution um, in Iran. And one of the things I pointed out in my piece was the remarkable hypocrisy of that argument, because on one hand, that's you know the narrative which which Khamenei, um, that's how he frames um, the obligatory hijab. On the other hand, uh, the Islamic Republic has this policy of uh, the temporary marriage, muta marriage, as you say it uh, in Arabic, and sirah as we call it in, in Persian, which which basically are uh, state um, legislated policies which make it far more easier for men to stray uh, from their marriages. Um, so, you know, uh, go, going back to, to your question of, you know, um, why do they view um, women as such, or, or why is this issue of, of sexuality and, and women's rights so, so important? Um, I don't think there's one explanation. Um, you know, I consulted with psychiatrists uh, uh, for this piece. I, I consulted with religious scholars, with political scientists. And there was a whole variety of reasons. I think for some of the, the Salafists and, and people like Osama bin Laden, um, it may be simple enough to say that they kind of use, view, view women as, 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 as almost like property, like livestock. Um, for, for people like uh, Khamenei, I, I think it's a little bit different. But I guess at the end of the day, if there is one meta-narrative which, which they all lead back to, it's control and it's power. made and I think in a way it's it's at base on in both of your pieces. I, I'm also struck just by the sort of historical consistency of what we're talking about here, right? Like Iran and, and Egypt are at different stages, right, of their sort of revolutionary trajectory and, and the narratives in, in many ways fit that. Listening to you, Mona, I can't help but think of some of our own history, you know, here in the United States when it comes to the civil rights movement. And uh, you know, I imagine uh, having read some of that history uh, that you would have found, uh, you know, some 
writers of, of early stage US feminist tracks in the early 1970s facing very similar criticisms uh, from the African American community, for example. Uh, you know, this sort of hierarchy of um, discrimination of, 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 of problems, if you will. And I, you know, it's just, it's a striking thing to me that, um, you know, can, can we learn from those experiences in many ways? Because uh, it's, it's a little bit striking, this, this notion that we have to reinvent the wheel all over again. Over, over. <laughs> right, yeah. yeah. I, I have to start by saying, though, to respond to what you said about Secretary Clinton, Susan, yeah. that it disturbs me on a very deep level that Secretary Clinton knows the problem yeah. of how so many religious fundamentalists are obsessed yeah. with women, and yet the U.S. administration supports and aids and gives aid to so many mm -hmm. governments and dictators, I shouldn't say governments, regimes, that actively discriminate against women. I mean, Sec Secretary Clinton will be sitting with the Saudi regime knowing how Saudi women are treated like children. Secretary Clinton will go and talk to SCAF, our military junta in Egypt, knowing the violations of women's rights that they've committed. So Secretary Clinton says things that sound really nice, mm -hmm. but the US administration knows very well that it continues to support regimes and governments in that part of the world mm -hmm. that treat women in, in, in the antithesis of nice. Yeah. No, so this is an important point that you're making. It troubles me deeply. Absolutely. I mean, I, the best of, of course, the, the, the most pointed example right now uh, is Afghanistan, uh, where you have the administration on the one hand saying, we support a uh, political reconciliation pro process, and that's going to be the only way there's going to be a settlement in Afghanistan. We have to come to resolution. On the other hand, you have Secretary Clinton, almost alone, by the way, out there saying uh, the rights of women as established under the new Afghan constitution constitute a red line. That's been the phrase that she's used repeatedly. These are, as, as we all know, you know, these are irreconcilable exactly. things to say. You know, this policy is not reconcilable with the idea that women's rights are a red line. You can't reconcile uh, with the Taliban and maintain uh, women's rights as, as written under that constitution. And yet exactly. we're sort of like, I feel like we're driving, you know, two parallel trains mm -hmm. down a track and it's, it's, it's a fairly sort of tragic kind of slow motion crash, yeah. right? Well, I, I, yeah. I, I think that, you know, one of the, one of the real challenges, and I, and I think that um, one of the more thoughtful responses to, to Mona's piece, I thought, was from Shadi Hamid uh, mm -hmm. at the Brookings Institute, who, mm -hmm. who, who, who pointed out that, you know, one of the real issues is that, you know, in some of these places in the Arab Muslim world, um, when there's more representative government, it's going to bring about um, policies and laws which may be actually more hostile to women, less tolerant of, of women. You mentioned uh, Afghanistan. Um, I remember um, my, my current boss, Marwan Mouashir, who, is, um, who um, was the former foreign minister of Jordan. Um, we were once in a meeting with him when he was foreign minister in 2003, and he was receiving, um, he was being criticized by um, a Jordanian um, liberal academic in the audience about why um, Jordan hadn't um, um, enacted sufficient reforms to bring about kind of representative government. He said that you know one of the challenges in Jordan is that we have an unelected uh, regime, unelected represented, uh, uh, unelected uh, uh, government officials, who in many ways are more uh, tolerant or progressive than the elected uh, representatives you see in the parliament. And he gave the example of honor killings. Mm -hmm that when the elected representatives of the people in the parliament get their say, they consistently try to enact laws that essentially make honor killings legal. And it's the unelected uh, um, uh, officials, you know, the, the king, um, who have to overturn those laws. And again, I think this is one of the dichotomies between Iran and the Arab world, uh, by virtue of the fact that um, in Iran you have had a population which has lived under a repressive Islamist regime for over three decades, no one anymore romanticizes about the prospect of joining religion and government. And I think that in many parts of the Arab world, uh, uh, maybe that, that experience has to still get out of people's system. I, I don't know if Mona would agree with that. No, I, many of the things you say resonate definitely in that in many parts of the Arab world, feminism is considered the kind of the pet project of the first lady. So some of the few concessions that Egyptian women have had over the past few years were pushed into place by uh, Jihan Sadat, for example, the wife of the late dictator Anwar Sadat, and most recently of Suzanne Mubarak, the, the wife of the former dictator 
Hosni Mubarak. So we've got to a stage now in Egypt where it, we're in this ludicrous situation where even so-called liberal political parties, even though I don't consider them a political party to begin with because they're so old and so out of ideas, but a party like the Waft Party, which is supposed to be liberal, is actively fighting alongside some Islamists one concession that Egyptian women are very happy with, which they got in the year 2000, which was the right to file for divorce, which interestingly enough, under it, many interpretations of Islamic law, they've had all along, but many Muslim countries deny them that right. So Muslim women are allowed to file for something called khola, which basically means to remove yourself from a marriage if you then also um, renounce your financial rights once you divorce yourself from the marriage. So Egyptian women got this right in the year 2000 after women's groups in Egypt had been pushing for it furiously. But it's now known as Suzanne's Law because it happened under Hosni Mubarak's regime. And Suzanne Mubarak was head of the National Council on Women. So any feminist progress that was achieved over the past 30 years is now considered part and parcel of that tainted regime. And people want to throw everything out. And we don't want to throw everything out. I don't really care who pushed for women's right to file for this divorce, at least we finally have this right. But what you're saying, Karim, I think this, this enchantment with this mirage of Islamic states, I think what's happening now with the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafis is actually a very good thing, because I think it's the beginning of the end of the Muslim Brotherhood. It's the beginning of the end of this, of this dream of the Islamist ruling, because what's happening is they have to choose between an ideology and a political party. Because being in politics will make you dirty, it will taint you, it will make you make concessions that as an ideology, you remain above. But when you're in parliament and you have to make concessions and when you have to run a country, you can't remain that pure. So the Muslim Brotherhood is still kind of trying to reckon with all of that. And so far in parliament, all they've obsessed over is internet pornography, banning English as a language to be taught in school, and reducing the age at which girls can marry. There's no talk of creating jobs. There's no talk of bringing back tourism. There's no talk of security on Egyptian streets. These are the concerns. And so according to a recent poll, Egyptians who don't belong to the movement or who aren't hardcore Muslim Brotherhood activists, 45% of Egyptians who said, they would vote for, who, who said they had voted for the Muslim Brotherhood said they wouldn't vote for them again, 45%. Because they've seen them in action. They've seen how they don't perform in parliament. And yes, they recognized they were a charitable organization that helped fill the social gaps that the Mubarak regime was not filling. But when it comes to politics, they don't do a very good job and they can't hide behind the victimhood that they used to hide under, under the Mubarak regime. Now, when you had the Green Movement in 2009, I was watching some very interesting reactions from young Muslim brothers and sisters who, whose life dream was to have an Islamic state. And yet they were watching young Iranian women and men getting the crap beaten out of them mm. by the Islamic State. Yeah. And they were sitting there thinking, do we want this? And you would think that this would be a lesson, that you don't want it, because Iranians have been fighting to get rid of it for 30 years. But we're going through it anyway, and it's a necessary process. We have to go through it in Egypt, because they have to go through this test, and they're not doing a good job. But my concern is that as they're not doing a good job, women are always the Achilles heel. It's always really easy to concede on women. We're the bargaining chips. When you want to make a compromise with someone, you give them women. And so in Saudi Arabia, when the royal family wants to, the continued support of the ultra-zealous clerics, they throw them women and they get everything else. So my concern in Egypt, and this is where the US administration does come in, don't invade as you supposedly did with Afghanistan, because you did not invade for women in Afghanistan, but you sold that war as a war for women. And it clearly wasn't, because you're selling Afghan women out now. But when it comes to Egypt, when you sit down with whoever ends up representing the Egyptian people, and they tell you, mind your business, this is our culture, this is our religion when it comes to women, say, no, it isn't. Because this is what ends up basically ending the conversation. We don't want you to invade, but we want the cultural relativism by which women are the cheapest bargaining chips to end. People talk about ethical foreign policies. What about an ethical foreign policy that for once says that the rights of more than 50% of your population actually important to us. That is ethical. You know, I think just a quick data point here that really shores this up. Go look uh, at the representation of women in peace talks that are mediated, by the way, by international institutions in which the US 
of course, plays a, a leading role, but so do many, many other countries. The numbers really are incredibly relevant to this conversation because the answer is that despite women taking major roles in, in, in civil conflicts around the world, in revolutions and political upheavals, they're almost always cut out uh, from the talks that really determine what the political order after the fact is going to be. And I, that's the process, I think, that we're seeing very much play out in, in Egypt right now. So, OK, so we're talking about politics. I want to quickly go to another sort of pillar of, of both of your articles in different ways and, and ask you to explain, you know, to me, to each other, and to this group, religion. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of back and forth about, so how much is it actually, in the end, the intertwining of religion and sex uh, that is what we're talking about here? You know, we've just talked about politics and being maybe the fuse uh, upon which the, this this conversation is lit, but do you believe, Mona, that 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 religion is inextricable to this this cultural and political fight, in, at least in Egypt? Absolutely, of course it is. I mean, I, I would I would be a fool if I said it wasn't. Mm -hmm. It's it's a toxic mix, as I said in my essay, of religion and culture. Mm -hmm. It's and, and and the way that it's mixed, that concoction is different in every country you go to. You know, I've been accused of of wildly generalizing. And I, I try not to generalize by giving examples from each country. But when you have 3,000 words, you can't write an, write an encyclopedia about every country. But where you can say a lot of these countries share similarities is that it is about the way Islam mixes with a culture. And, and, and the end result is what we see on the ground. And Because a lot of people will, will basically get out of this question by telling you, no, 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 it has nothing to do with religion. It's all about culture. It's a really dishonest answer. Mm -hmm. It's about religion and culture. Mm -hmm. And it's about how the two of them are used as tools together to create whatever mix you see on the ground. Now, in some instances, religion is used more, and in others, it's used less. And clearly, it's according to how each country interprets religion. But when you look at most of the countries in the region, take Egypt again, for example, my country of birth. Again, it's, it's how it focuses on women. The entire legal system in Egypt has, by and large, been modernized, except when it comes to family law. And when it comes to family law, you, if you're a Muslim, you follow what Egypt's interpretation of Islamic law is. And if you're a Christian, you, for, you follow canonical law. So if you're a Coptic Christian and you want a divorce in Egypt, you can't get one because the Coptic church doesn't believe in divorce. And some Christians in Egypt actually convert to Islam to get a divorce and then convert back. And you get a whole lot of problems from that. <laughs> when you're a Muslim and you follow Egypt's interpretation of Islam, the husband can basically say, I divorce you three times, and the wife is divorced. The wife, thanks to legislation in 2000, but only if she has, if she's affluent. Because if you're an average working class Egyptian woman, and you have to renounce any financial rights that you gain after divorce, you can't afford to ask, you can't afford to remove yourself from the marriage in the way that this legislation allows you to. So even this legislation that was supposed to help women, only rich women in Egypt can take advantage of. So if you're a, an average working class woman in Egypt, you are screwed every step of the way when it comes to family law. Because you're talking about extremely conservative interpretations of both Christianity and Islam. So of course it's about religion. How can it not be about religion? In, in, in all the countries across the region, some more than others. Do you agree? Uh, yeah, I mean, there was um, one of the things I, I described in the piece was um, finding um, uh, Khomeini's, one of Khomeini's religious treaties uh, in my home as a young boy. I was probably 11, 12 years old. And I found this book from Khomeini. And, um, you know, one of the things you read is that Khomeini says that um, um, if you've had sex with a camel, um, the, the meat is no longer halal. And he goes into kind of great detail about issues like bestiality and things like that, which was both horrifying and, and bewildering for me um, uh, as a young boy. And, um, and so, um, you know, you look at kind of these, um, these Shiite clerics who, who uh, espouse to be uh, what we call marja uh, taqlid, uh, sources of emulation. And this was a rite of passage which all Shiite clerics of that generation um, had to go through. It wasn't anything uh, unique to Khomeini. So, I was speaking to one of uh, my friends who himself was uh, reared in Qom, um, whom I quote in the piece, Mehdi Khalaji. And he said, you know, the problem wasn't that Khomeini addressed these issues of, of you know, bestiality and uh, incest and kind of all these issues which 
appear to us maybe quite loose. He said, that's not the problem. Um, all religions in some ways, whether it's Judaism or Christianity, they've addressed these issues. But the problem is that Islamic jurisprudence hasn't really modernized. So if you're a, a young urban professional living in Tehran, 98% of what Khomeini wrote in this book, it's called um, um, Clarification of Questions, Tozil Masoel, is totally irrelevant to you. And you know, I write in the piece that that's why, uh, in some ways, Khomeini is now increasingly the butt of jokes of Iran's post-revolutionary generation. And I quote um, a cartoonist, a friend of mine, Nico Han Kosar, who said, listen, you know, I never ever saw a camel growing up in Tehran, let alone was I tempted to have sex with one. Um, so, so, so that's one point. But, but so in some ways, it is very much about religion. In other ways, it's not about religion. Let me make a point which kind of goes to Mona's um, argument about how women are oftentimes kind of the first, uh, the first bargaining chip, and even uh, secular groups, secular um, forces often acquiesce in the face of um, uh, intolerance towards women. This is kind of a, a very micro um, um, anecdote to make kind of a more macro point. And, um, when I was based in Tehran several years back, I remember I was at the home of a relative, kind of a, a third cousin, who is a devout atheist who has no um, affection whatsoever for Khomeini or for the regime or for, for, for anything related to um, Islamism. And uh, he was having an argument with uh, um, a woman who lived above him, um, who him claims was making too much noise, and they were having some type of a spat. And uh, she came down um, to, to um, talk it over with him. And um, you know, there's been an ongoing disagreement between them. And she came down, and she wasn't wearing the, uh, the veil. And after five minutes of, of arguing with her, and I think he was probably very much in the wrong, uh, knowing him, um, and the woman was re uh, uh, unrelenting, he, he said to her, I don't argue with women who don't wear hijab. And, and you see that you know, this is someone who doesn't believe in the hijab, who hates the hijab, who hates the Islamic Republic, who is an atheist. And they go and they rely on these kind of official state policies, which they don't necessarily agree with, but they, they can use them for their own um, expediency on these very kind of uh, micro issues. Well, you know, in, in, and in recognition of, of the role of religion, you have this term Islamic feminist, which some movements have come up to address as a way of recognizing that because you have so much of this based in a, really, a very conservative religious interpretation, the best and most effective way to fight it is to use a more progressive interpretation. There is a movement that I belong to now. I, I don't identify it as, a, as an Islamic feminist. I'm, a Muslim is one thing and feminist is another, and I don't combine the two. But there is a movement that I belong to called Musawa, which is the Arabic word for equality. And it's a movement that was launched in Kuala Lumpur in 2009. And it's a movement for equality and justice in the Muslim family. And it focuses exactly on what I was talking about, family law, in the recognition that family law in many Muslim-majority countries is extremely discriminatory towards women. And they're about to move their general secretariat to Cairo. And I think the timing couldn't be better, because they're moving to Cairo at a time when you have this extremely conservative and growingly conservative rhetoric when it comes to, to Islam and religion in the public space because of, of, of the, the preponderance of Islamists in, in parliament. And, and what they try to do is they combine various ways of fighting that ultra-conservative rhetoric. And one of them is to employ all these Islamic feminist scholars who do reinterpretations of the religion according to their own studies and scholarship of it. And in some instances, it does help because in Egypt, I mean, I can see situ situations in Egypt where in order to fight the rhetoric of the Muslim Brotherhood and in order to fight the rhetoric of the, of the Salafis, you might, need, you might feel that you have to come up with you know, X, Y, and Z verses from the Quran and X, Y, and Z of what the Prophet said. And in that instance, it can be helpful because you can fight their verse with their verse. But my misgivings about just fighting their rhetoric with just religion is that you get into this arm wrestling competition, my verse versus your verse. So we will end up getting, in Egypt, what we need to do is to establish, and this has to be something, and a lot of people involved in the revolution recognize this. We have to establish something that, that resembles here what we call avoiding the tyranny of the majority. Regardless of who is in power, regardless of who dominates parliament, there has to be a guarantee of everybody's rights. Minority rights, women's rights, gay and lesbian rights, atheist rights, just a bill of rights that guarantees, regardless of where you stand, 
vis-a-vis -vis Islam or Christianity or God, you have a right as an Egyptian to, to, be, to be free, basically. And, and, and this is the kind of Egypt that I want. I want an Egypt that recognizes the rights of everybody, regardless of the beliefs of those who sit in parliament and who sit in our presidency. Well, I think Kareem clearly has made an important point about, uh, you know, sort of sexism and misogyny not being limited, uh, you know, to the conservative clerics who are promoting uh, these views in, in Egypt or Iran or, or anywhere else for that matter. Uh, if anything, though, it is striking that, that both of your pieces uh, detail in some very telling ways the extent to which it's almost a fusion of conservative Islamic clerics with modern tools of technology, with the convening power uh, that a revolution brings, uh, you know, with uh, the, the power of the television pulpit in the, in the case of Sheikh uh, Karadawi, for example, uh, that you have perhaps uh, legacy religious conversations, right, about, you know, donkeys and camels and, and so forth being fused uh, with, these, with these modern methods of propagating it and giving them an even more powerful uh, bully pulpit. So I think that's an interesting, you know, sort of aspect of this. I mean, you write, Mona, in your piece about uh, Sheikh Karadawi and the, the persistence, for example, of the uh, debates over female genital mutilation, which I thought was a very uh, revealing part of the piece. No, absolutely. We have, we have a female parliamentarian who just a few weeks ago, she belongs to the Muslim Brotherhood, said that FGM is a form of beautification. This is a woman. So you have to ask also about the internalization of these incredibly misogynistic messages by so many women involved both in the movement and outside of the movement. Because at some level, when you're a woman in a conservative society, you recognize what you need to say and what you need to pretend to believe and maybe what you think you believe in order to exist in that society. It becomes your passport to whatever, you know, like 1% of whatever you're allowed to exist in. And so you recognize what needs to be done in order to be accepted in this conservative society. And sometimes what needs to be done is the internalization of things that are, that are antithetical to your freedom of existence as a female in that society. Now, you know, talking about viral, I think, I think one very interesting um, way of watching the kind of the backlash against the conservatives, the conservative use of YouTube and all the other things. I mean, young people have been using YouTube and others to promote a much more liberal message, but something that has come about that many people have been sending me over the past few days is a speech that Gamal Abdel Nasser gave in the 1950s, I mean, late 1950s, uh, uh, early 1960s, or maybe even in the 1960s. And in this speech, He's addressing a group of Egyptians, and he claims that he had just met with the Muslim Brotherhood Supreme Guide. And the Muslim Brotherhood Supreme Guide, according to Abdel Nasser, had said to him, our aim is to have every single Egyptian woman on every street wearing a headscarf. And Gamal Abdel Nasser laughs, and the, and the audience laugh. Now, if the, this is in the 1960s, and they think it's funny, because back then in Egypt, hardly anyone covered her hair. And when you look at Egypt today, so we're talking now 40, 50 years later, almost every woman in Egypt covers her hair. So people are sending this video of Gamal Abdel Nasser addressing Egyptians and saying, they want to take us back to the era of the caliphate. What are they talking about? By way of social commentary on Egypt today and asking what has happened to Egypt today. And basically the social conquest, if you like, or the social victory of this very conservative message before the Islamists even got into parliament. Now, some people have accused me of being anti-Islamist, but I tell them some of the, of the laws that I drew attention to in my essay were put into place by these nominally secular dictators that we had. This law that allows an Egyptian man to beat his wife with quote unquote good intentions was not put into place by the Brotherhood or the Salafis. It was put into place by a succession of dictators that we've had in Egypt. But my concern is, Building on this extremely misogynistic law, what will the Islamists do? Where are their laws going to take us? And if we don't start fighting hard now, what will happen to Egyptian women? That's the whole point of my piece. Yeah. So I want to make sure we get to your questions. Uh, just quickly before we do, Mona, I have to go back to you, something I've been meaning to ask you. And somehow we never got a chance to talk about this in the editing process. Mm -hmm. There's a really fascinating passage in your piece where you're talking about uh, when you lived in Saudi Arabia mm -hmm. as a young woman and you talk about how you were traumatized into feminism. There's no other word uh, to describe it is what you said in the piece. And you talked about this just extraordinary example that stuck with you where you kept hearing uh, that it was impure uh, if a baby boy 
were to pee on you before you went to prayers, it was okay. You could keep the same clothes on, but if a baby girl did so, you had to change your clothes. And you kept wondering what on earth was there that was so impure in the baby girl that uh, made you have to do that. And I thought, wow, that's, that's just an extraordinary moment. It, it, for a girl of 15, he, it just must have been mind-blowing for you. Well, I, I didn't hear it over and over again. I only needed to hear it once yeah. for it to, to really hit home. And we, my, you know, I was, I was born in Egypt, and my family moved to London when I was seven. And then we moved to Saudi Arabia when I was 15. And moving to Saudi Arabia from the UK at the age of 15 as a teenage girl, I mean, being a teenage girl anywhere at the age of 15 is incredibly <laughs> difficult. But moving to Saudi Arabia from the UK at the age of 15 was, was it was like someone had turned the lights off. Some, some deep, deep trauma was, was struck in me. And it, it really has made me the woman I am. I mean, it, I would not have been the person or the woman I am if we had not moved to Saudi Arabia. Because I learned many things. I mean, I learned that the Islam that I was brought up with, my parents both moved to London so they could both get a PhD in medicine. So clearly I grew up in a home that believed my mother and my father could achieve you know, the, the heights of their profession. So when it comes to women's agency, I had agency at home. I had a mother who showed me by example that you could have a PhD in medicine. But outside, in, in, in Saudi Arabia, I, I was getting the complete opposite message. And very early on, I actually, I wanted to wear a headscarf very soon after we moved to Saudi Arabia because I wanted to hide. I wanted to hide from the way that men in Saudi Arabia were looking at me because I, I felt com utterly objectified every minute of the day. And my parents told me when I was 15, I was too young. They said, you're too young, you're not ready. But then by the time I hit 16, I, I honestly, I fell into a deep, deep depression in Saudi Arabia. I, I could not handle the religious suffocation. So I basically struck this deal with God. I said, okay, listen, they keep telling me that, you know, to be a good Muslim, I should cover my hair. Fine, I'll cover my hair if you save my mind, okay? And I would continue to lose my mind. So clearly God was not keeping his end of the deal. So... I discovered feminist journals at the age of 19 in my university in Saudi Arabia. And here's another irony, feminist journals at the university in Saudi Arabia. So clearly there were some renegade female professors in Saudi Arabia who were beginning the revolution inside the library, thank God, because they helped save my mind. And, and that's where I was talking about the trauma, you know, feminism by trauma, because I, I could not digest the, 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 and there's no way to talk about it other than say the hatred of women that exists in Saudi Arabia and feminism saved me. Okay, that's pretty powerful stuff. So I'm gonna give us a second to digest that and, and I do wanna get to as many questions as possible. Please give us your name and, and tell us what organization you're with uh, when you ask the questions. Uh, so we'll start here and then here. Hi, Rachel Oswald, I'm a journalist. Mona, if you could respond to, I think it was um, a, a response to your article in The Atlantic where they said that the, the, um, the move to the right um, in Muslim countries was lar on, on family law issues and women's rights issues was largely a result of um, imperialist policies that basically said, okay, we're going to control your economy, we're going to control your, um, your foreign relations, but we will allow you to control the women, you know, the private sphere. And, you know, then when you had autocrats take over and um, absolute monarchies come to power, they continued that tradition, kind of solving, you know, to the, el to the village elders and the... Um, and um, and whatnot. So my, but my thinking is, is once you have parliaments, even if they are Islamist-led, having genuine power and really getting down to the day-to-day -day business of ruling their countries and trying to improve their economies, that these issues of, you know, whether a woman should wear the hijab or other issues, they're just they are going to fall to the bottom because they're simply not as important and they're going to be for the first time empowered with truly, you know, meaty issues like treaties, like, you know, um, other things. And I was wondering what your response to that would be. Well, that is the hope that when they really do get down to governing, that they do focus on the things that people elected them to focus on. Because the, the three main concerns of Egyptians right now is job creation, uh, getting the economy back on track and feeling secure in the street because people keep hearing about carjackings and other acts of violence because our police force is not doing a very good job because its job all along was always to protect the regime and not the people. 
And we haven't seen that from, from the Islamists in Parliament. Now, some people say it's because the military junta doesn't give them all the freedom that they want. And I agree that it's difficult to rule under military rule, but you can at least make a pretense at trying to care about the issues that Egyptians have elected you to vote in or, or, or to represent them for. This post-colonial argument is very interesting, actually, because a lot of, a lot of people, especially academics, have thrown this post-colonial argument at me. And, and, and I've got to wonder, I mean, two things. First of all, Egypt got rid of British rule back in 1956. If we wanted to put things back on track, we could have, but we didn't. And second of all, you know, Edward Said, God bless him, may he rest wherever he's laying right now. He came up with the theory of Orientalism 40 years ago, when the region was a very different part of the world than it is today. But our academics, especially in Middle East studies and, and those who focus on that part of the world, are stuck in this, in this time frame and these theories that address a very recently post-colonial region and haven't caught up with the reality on the ground. And I think they're having a very difficult time catching up with the revolutions because they did not see them coming. Because unfortunately, their post-colonial theories fed into the very stereotypes that we, the people of the region, have been trying to fight all along, which are the stereotypes of agency. We always heard from these very same academics that are now accusing me of being a neo-Orientalist that you know, Arab exceptionalism, Arabs like their strong-armed leader. Arabs are different. Egyptians are these docile people who like their pharaohs because the Nile is a very still river that runs very slowly, and Egyptians have a nice sense of humor that helps them buffer the horrendous dictatorship they live under. It was outrageous. These stereotypes were outrageous, and they were, they were, they were fueled by these post-colonial theories that these academics are obsessed with. Meanwhile, people on the ground are saying, no, no, excuse me. You like our pharaohs. We don't like our pharaohs. We just got rid of a pharaoh. So we, the people on the ground, have run far ahead of these academics. They're having a hard time catching up. And they're basically saying, could you please slow down until I come up with a theory for you? And we're saying, you know what? When you're ready to catch up with us, then we'll talk. It's stunning. It's stunning to me that they're watching people on the ground grab agency by the throat and say, we are autonomous people. And we will not wait for your theories. And we will not wait for our dictators or the US administration, or the European Union to recognize our demand for freedom and dignity. And they still want to sit there and discuss post-colonial theory with me. It's amazing, amazing. Do you want to jump in well, there I quickly? Uh, there was a very yeah. famous book um, that came out uh, in Iran, I think the late 60s, early 70s, by uh, a very famous leftist intellectual in Iran called uh, Jalal Ahmad. And he wrote this book called Qarb Zadigi, which in English is translated as West Toxification. And it was, it was basically an indictment of Iran under the Shah, uh, uh, um, basically um, you know, Western uh, values and Western influence permeating throughout the country. And now, uh, after 34 years after the revolution, uh, Jalal Ahmed has been someone who's been thoroughly discredited in Iran. Um, and what now uh, kind of the liberal intelligentsia in Iran says, listen, if, if, um, if um, um, Tolerance and, and uh, free speech and economic prosperity makes us West toxified. Let's be West toxified. Um, you know, there, there are some positive attributes and values we can, we can get from um, the West and, and the era of the Enlightenment. And not all indigenous values um, are, are, are great. Okay, I know I promised you there. Uh Hi, my name is Callie and I work for the International Crisis Group and I live in Cairo and I've been living there now for a few months and before that I lived in Lebanon and I'm originally Iraqi so I've sort of been all over the Middle East. So my question for you is, Mona, um, what is it specifically about post-revolution Egypt that has this sort of endemic hatred of women that you talk about, which I haven't felt in Lebanon or in Iraq, where I've definitely felt discrimination against women that is absolutely enraging, but this, this sort of endemic hatred that you talk about, I think, is something very specific to post-revolution Egypt. And I was in Egypt before the revolution. I didn't feel it as much. So I wonder, is there something institutionally different about Egypt and Saudi and these countries and the Levant and Iraq and, and Syria and some of these others? And for Karim, I was wondering, um, since you're an expert on Iran, what is the difference when you look at Iran and Saudi Arabia, the trajectories between Shia and Sunni Islam for women? What is it like to be a woman in, in Iran versus a woman in Saudi? And does this have to do with different interpretations of Islam? Great question. Thank you. Um, well, when you look at Egypt, I think it's important to look at the three or four years in the run-up to the, to the revolution as well. I mean, the Mubarak regime 
in 2005, for example, instituted this, this systematic policy of sexually assaulting female journalists and activists that I describe as sexual terrorism. It's beyond sexual assault. When the regime uses this in a systematic way, for me, it's sexual terrorism. And what it ended up doing was giving a green light, saying basically that women's bodies are fair game. And, and this happened very infamously in May when Egyptians were called to go and vote on a referendum to change our constitution, um, specifically regarding the way we elect a president, because up until then it was just Mubarak, yes or no. And in 2005, it became Mubarak versus several other candidates because of this referendum. And in May of 2005 was when we began to see clearly and openly, even though in the past it was happening secretly with the women of the Muslim Brotherhood, the Egyptian regime would threaten to rape the, say, the, the, the female relatives of wanted members of Islam, or wanted Islamists, and, and in many cases they would rape them, but, but not openly. And this was something, this was like an open secret in the Islamists circle. But in May of 2005, they did it clearly and openly in front of everybody, and there's video footage to prove it. But no one stood trial and no one was held accountable. And what that ended up doing, as I said, was it gave a green light that women's bodies were fair game. The next year, in 2006, ordinary Egyptian men went on a rampage during Eid, after Ramadan, September 2006, when they went downtown Cairo and sexually assaulted ordinary women out celebrating this religious festival. Again, no one was held accountable, and the interior ministry said it didn't even happen. They denied that it happened. So when you, when you are sexually assaulted by the regime, and you're sexually assaulted by your fellow, your compatriots, and no one is held accountable, that for me is hate. That for me is a system that is out to get you, and is, is not interested in showing you justice. And what, what ended up happening with the revolution is that women were out there on the front lines with men, then you had the army, the military junta, using these so-called virginity tests, and then women having to overcome sexual assaults in the square itself and during protests. To the extent, and not, not just from the revolutionaries, but from ordinary Egyptians, maybe not interested in the revolution, who saw this mass gathering as a chance to go out there and harass women in ways that Egyptian women face every day. I mean, if you lived in Cairo, you know how endemic to Egyptian society sexual harassment and sexual assaults of women are. The, day, the last time I was in Cairo was on International Women's Day for a march to parliament. The day before we marched through downtown Cairo, I was there by myself. I was interviewing an artist at the Swiss embassy, and I was waiting for a cab. And I was dressed in a long skirt and long sleeves, and I felt so uncomfortable. I just wanted to disappear, just waiting for a cab because of the way men were looking at me. And the next day, I was marching with fellow Egyptian women and men, and I was telling another feminist this. And as we're talking about this and how uncomfortable we feel in public in Cairo, we're surrounded by a cordon of men who are protecting our march because that's what we need in Cairo. Sadly, this is revolutionary Egypt. We need a cordon of men to protect our International Women's Day March because the year before, men not involved in the revolution but ordinary men pounced on women who were demonstrating for women's rights and, and, and attacked them. So if we need to be protected during a march for International Women's Day, I think that is the answer to your question. There is something about the impunity with which sexual assaults happen in Egypt and no one is held accountable that permeates society and gives out the message that women's bodies are fair game. And so women cover thinking it's going to protect them, but it doesn't because more than 80% of women are covered in Egypt in one form or another and they still get sexually assaulted. It's not a, a protection. So the legal system, the cultural system, the social system, the moral system, the revolution of the mind that I spoke of in the essay is what is needed to overcome this impunity by which people think my body is fair game. Um, let, let me say this, that um, when, um, when the 1978-79 revolution happened, um, the iconic images, the iconic faces that emerged from that revolution were the faces of bearded, um, traditional men, basically. And if you look at the 2009 uprisings in Iran, the iconic images that emerged, the iconic faces, were faces of young, modern, educated women, like uh, Neda Agha Sultan, the, the woman who, whose death was captured um, on, on cell phone. A and so I, I very much think that um, women are going to be at the forefront. They are at the forefront of, of any type of political change uh, in Iran. And uh, part of it, you know, so, so contrasting with Saudi Arabia, part of it is, is, is uh, 
if you look at the, the, the sweeping history of the last century, um, that in 1925, um, Iran had uh, a dictator, Reza Shah, who banned the veil, basically uh, prohibited women from wearing the veil. And in the piece, I talk about my own family's uh, trajectory, kind of the trajectory of the urban middle class over that century, that my grandmother, who was born in 1907, um, didn't have, wasn't educated beyond elementary school, and she wore a, a, a chador all of her life. Um, of her four daughters, three of them um, were university educated, uh, and, and none of them wore the veil. And of their uh, daughters, um, um, you know, none of them uh, wore the veil. All of them were educated at a post-grad level, and religion wasn't a huge part of their life. So that's kind of Iran's um, uh, trajectory over the last century. And, and of course, the 1979 revolution tried to turn things in the opposite direction. But I think that um, Saudi Arabia has had a much different history, of course, than, than Iran. And um, you know, whereas in Iran you have 60% uh, of university students uh, are now women, in Saudi Arabia, I think there's still women are still agitating for somewhat more elementary freedoms, like the right, like the right to drive. But I think that this is one of the, I guess it's one of the critiques when we try to um, capture uh, the quote-unquote Middle East in a thousand words or two thousand words. That these countries are all incredibly difficult, uh, incredibly different, and have very very diverse histories. And I think they will all have very um, unique trajectories, um, which. Um, you know, you know, some of them will, will coincide and overlap, but in many ways, I think they'll have very different trajectories. Thank you. All right, we have time for a few more questions. I'm going to get someone in the back here. Yes, you? Yeah. I actually meant two back, but uh, I'll, we'll try to get to you too. Yes, this guy. Thank you. Uh, my name is Ash Rafael. Um, I'm a CEO of a public company that has offices in Egypt. I'm also chairman of a nonprofit that was recently shut down in Egypt. Um, so we have interest in this topic from both sides, the business side, also the social side. Um, I appreciate all the effort. Uh, we follow you, we support you. Um, you know, the, 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 your cause is noble and, and the war is justified. My concern, my question is, we seem to, uh, there are three influences at play. There's a political influence, there's a social influence, political influence on the society itself. But it'll, so social influence on itself and religious influence on society. It seems like a lot of the issues that you've described in several examples are put in one bucket and pinned maybe in one direction. And one of the first rules of war is to know your enemy. And I feel that the, the war is not directed at the, in, in the right area. So for example, when you talk about the proper way of beating women or marrying women at 14, this is religious text. That's a different war. Uh, that has nothing to do with leadership. Uh, policy doesn't come from a vacuum and gets down past to society and say, you know, okay, let's create uh, women uh, policies that are pro-women. I mean, society itself has to kind of rise and demand that in order for policy to be created and then push down. I think a lot of the examples that you gave in how parliament in Egypt is, well, these are non-political people. They came from society. The reason why you're seeing their bad influence is because they are a representation of society. So can, can you help us kind of, what is the plan for the agenda to change society? Because I don't think you'll be able to change religion. I don't think you'll be able to influence policy unless society itself, it seems in Egypt, as we are seeing our organization being shut down, our businesses impacted, that society wants to be that way. It's their desire to oppress women. It's their, th that's the way society itself. It has nothing to do with anything else. So how do you address the core? How do you address society itself? Thank you. So you're basically agreeing with my, with my thesis that they hate women, is what you're saying. But how do we, how do we fight that? Well, I mean, it's a multi-pronged war. I'm not, I'm not saying we should just focus on one thing. First of all, I'm not a policymaker, so I don't know what the policy should be. But when it comes to society, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, when, when we first heard that Salafis would be head of the Education Committee in Parliament, a lot of people thought it would be a disaster. Because, you know, the Salafis are the ultra-right wing. They're the most conservative of the Islamists in the Egyptian Parliament. And people thought this would be a disaster, especially when it came to the field of education. And then I asked a friend of mine who works with, with young people in Egypt, is this really going to be a disaster? And he said to me, you know, 
it looks in theory like it will be a disaster, but seeing as the education system in Egypt is really bad, they're actually not going to be able to do much because once they get through how bad the curricula are, once they get through the fact that there aren't enough schools, once they get through the fact that the schools are overcrowded, and so on and so forth, but also when push comes to shove, the Salafis like to make a big deal about how they're going to segregate the boys and girls and they're going to teach the girls how to cook and prepare them to become homemakers and they're going to teach the boys how to be the providers. But when you look at Egyptian society where more than 30% of families are women-led because these women cannot afford not to work, you look at the reality on the ground and this is the society that you're talking about. This is not a society that can afford to be told all girls are going to be homemakers and all boys are going to be out there making jobs or having jobs and making money. So this is a society that is clearly in need of a lot of jobs. And this is how you change society. This is what the woman over here was saying. Once they get down to the nitty gritty of ruling or the nitty gritty of actually representing what people want them to represent them for, they will have to create jobs and they'll stop obsessing over women. I don't know if it's a case of waiting for society to catch up with you because if we wait for a society that hates me, to finally stop hating me, that's too long to wait. I'm very impatient. I'm not going to wait for them to stop hating me. I'm, I'm going to demand those rights as a fact, especially after a revolution. You know, I didn't get my arms broken in Tahrir Square, so I can wait for society to catch up with the fact that it's horrendous to hate me. That's just ridiculous. So if I have to kick that society in the butt, I'll kick it. But at the same time, those representing me have to be real and understand that Egyptians want jobs. Egyptians want tourism to come back. Egyptians want you to stop obsessing, as I keep saying, the Christian coalition here do this as well. Stop obsessing over my vagina. This is not what Egyptians voted you to do. Egyptians voted you to create jobs because it's about more than sex and, and family values and headscarves. It's about getting the country to work again. So I don't, I don't have solutions. You know, a lot of people have criticized me because I didn't come up with solutions. It's not my job to come up with solutions. It's my job as a writer to poke people and say, this is really wrong. So I, I don't know, I don't have a full and complete answer to what you're saying, but to combine what you asked me with what the woman before you asked, there are women like Samira Ibrahim, who tried to sue the military junta, who was of that society. She comes from a conservative family in southern Egypt, and if she had waited for society to stop hating her, she would not have sued the military junta. On some very deep and fundamental level, this 25-year-old Egyptian woman believes she deserves dignity, and so she sued the military junta. This is what a revolution is about. It's about, and revolutions are never created by a majority. If we waited for the majority to create the revolution, it would never come. The revolution comes through a small group of very pissed off people who say this is wrong. So I think we, we just need to get a good, small, core group of people in Egypt to be righteously indignated about what's going on and say this is wrong. And that message begins to reverberate. And, and the reality on the ground is we need jobs. Once you combine those two things together, they'll stop obsessing over sex and vaginas. Just a, just a quick point. Uh, I don't remember who it was who said that uh, you know, one of the problems in the Middle East is that the extremists go all the way and the moderates just go away. Um, and, and I think that you know, looking back at the, the history of the Iranian Revolution, um, it was really a remarkable dereliction of duty on the part of the liberal intelligentsia. It was re they, they failed the country. And, and so I think that if there's a lesson here, the lesson isn't that you, you simply acquiesce and you give up and you say, well, that's how the majority wanted. Um, I, I think retrospectively, um, had people uh, fought for, for these values which they ostensibly championed, whether it's women's rights or free speech, et cetera, um, the country may not find itself in the mess um, that, it is, that it is right now. And um, um, you know, one of the things which I'll tell you I found um, somewhat disappointing in the reaction to, to Mona's piece is that you know, the Arab world is very much at a crossroads. And I think what was disappointing is that uh, Arab and, and Muslim liberals it seems to me oftentimes spend more effort fighting their fellow Arab and Muslim liberals rather than really championing the, 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 the causes which they, they ostensibly support. You know, I think we're not going to be able to end on a stronger note than this. Uh, and we promised everyone here uh, that we would 
wind up at 5.30. The good news is that we want you to continue the conversation amongst yourselves uh, here tonight. We have some, some drinks for those of you who've been kind enough to spend your time with us. We hope you'll stay uh, and en engage with each other, engage with our authors. I, I particularly really do want to, before everyone gets up, I want to thank Mona and Kareem uh, because I think this has been an extraordinary conversation, one that we don't have often enough uh, here in Washington. And uh, it's, it's my privilege to host you both here and in the pages of our magazine. And I hope the audience will join me in thanking both of you for really an extraordinary conversation.